You want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about sports in the state of Michigan? You can't handle the truth! Well, we're giving you the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Stables Media, the show that provides research and statistics about all the Detroit and Michigan sports teams, whether fans like it or not, and detects, exposes, and reveals actual and hidden facts and truth that the mainstream media doesn't want you to know. No junk, no entertainment, no homerism, no slappiness, no coddling, no pop culture, no conspiracy theories, no opinions, no shilling, and no fluff. Head over to our website, the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast, podcast.com follow us on twitter periscope and instagram at michigan underscore truth and like and share our verified facebook page the michigan sports truth podcast also listen to us on spreaker Castbox, iHeartRadio, google podcast apple podcast via itunes and spotify and like staples media on facebook <laughs> The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers, nor does it represent or compete against any mainstream media in the state of Michigan. It is also not for entertainment or debating purposes. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. And it is for every sports fan's own good because the truth is out there. And welcome to another episode of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Stables Media. I'm Taylor Phillips, along with Ed Smith and Frank Vazner. Ed Smith, welcome back. We're going to start with the opening statement. Been three weeks, but your opening statement first, please. My opening statement is that uh, my absence and now return to this program is about as symbolic as you can in, uh, in terms of ending out this dreadful year, but showing that next year is the beginning of a brand new step and what it means also for all of our teams as well. All right, Frank, your opening statement. My opening statement for this week is, as the year that 2020 was, whether it may have been bad for most people, it's a time to reflect on what happened that was good, and also a time to look forward into 2021, especially where this venture is going next year, and it's going to be big. Oh yeah, my opening statement, we are seeing the first stages of the Lions roster decimating. Before we get started, we want to remind everyone to download the all-new social sports app called Big It, which influences more and more people to love sports. Enter the referral code STABLES when you sign up. Available on the Apple App Store and Google Play, download the Big It app and sign up with a referral code STABLES with a capital S and the letter B in the middle, lowercase. Now, uh, Ed, we're going to start with you uh, since you were gone the last two weeks. Uh, just give us your analogy and your knowledge of all that transpired the past three weeks. Go ahead. Basically, what what it is to re- to recap is that the Lions have essentially quit on themselves. They have slowly but surely seen their playoff hopes dwindle and dwindle out to the point where what we saw them do, the effort, if you want to call it that, that they put up against Tampa Bay, was insulting. Yes, I understand that the majority of their coaches, uh, their coaching staff, was un- uh, un- unavailable due to the uh, COVID-related reasons. I understand that. I also understand that you know you're not you've been tinkering and tankering with all sorts of different combinations and you've gone through stretches where you were missing this player or missing that player but that's the nature of the game sometimes things like that happen that you're going to be without your best players but it's what you do to adjust to that um that defines who you are and that's what they did not do and as evident by what they saw they fired matt patricia but trust me it, it goes beyond patricia the defense the general mood general direction it's just absolutely at an all-time low right now. That's saying something compared to a point. Now, remember, this team went 0-16 just a few short years ago, okay? Now you thought that was as bottom as you could possibly get, and you thought that, hey, we're getting this young quarterback now in exchange. Maybe that'll be like the silver lining we've waited for all along. And for a few years, it looked promising. It really did. But now, over time, we are seeing once again, just like we saw with Barry Sanders, just like we saw with Calvin Johnson, and even to an extent with Ndamukong Sue, we are seeing... Yet another generational talent being wasted by this inept franchise. And it's getting beyond frustrating and tiring at this point. It's like, you know, what they say about what's the definition of insanity is seeing the same thing happening over and over and over again, expect to see something else different. Well, how many times do you have to see something else different before you recognize things have to change? I can respect on one aspect, the Ford family seeking now an advisory group to help them with football-related decisions, whether it's listening to... Uh, people such as Chris Spielman and Barry Sanders, for instance. But something like that should have been put in place a long, long, long time ago, okay? What took them so long to get this type of uh, grasp of empathy 
uh, that that the fans have have wanted and needed for so long. You know, it's obviously a case of too little, too late as far as, as, far as I'm concerned. But we'll see where they can do, go from there. Now, as far as Matthew Stafford is concerned, quite a few quite a few things to take away from this. One, his continuing commitment to wanting to play no matter what. Whether it's through injury, whether the team is absolutely bad, whether there is no playoff spot available or not, it doesn't matter. Stafford is a guy who wants to show that, hey, if I'm up and I'm able and I'm ready, I'm willing to play. Because guess what? Yeah, I'm the quarterback. Yeah, I'm the highest paid player. Yeah, I'm getting all this and that. But I'm still a guy that works his butt off just as much as everybody else here. And with the expectation and the contract that I'm getting, I have to show a standard. I have to show what leadership is. And I commend him for that. But... It comes to a point also to where you understand, like, Matt, I know you're, you want to be a guy that wants to be as loyal as you can possibly can be. And while you, there may not be a portion that have always supported you, you always know who your backers have been, and I understand and respect that. But there comes a point where you have to have a conversation with yourself. What is the point of me getting beat up year in and year out if I'm just going to keep losing? That's what happened to Calvin, and that's what happened to Barry. And it's looking like it's happening to Stafford right now as we speak. I mean, you roll an ankle, that goes on top of the thumb injury, that goes on top of the rib injury, that goes on top of the back-to-back back injuries, years of your season ending with back injuries, so on top of so many other things. But as a representative, not just that, a symbolic representation of what this team truly is without him would have been screaming for years of why they needed to get reliable, valuable backup quarterbacks, not the David Blaus or the Chase Daniels of the world, real reliable backup quarterbacks. You had a good one to Sean Hill. You let him go. You've been splat ever since, okay? Uh, don't get me started on why they should have gotten Colin Kaepernick. That's another discussion for another day. You Otherwise, you wouldn't have been in a situation such as this. But now it shows not only that, not only the performance show that this team has completely quit under season, it also shows that, listen, it's time for a change once again. And for Stafford's worth and his loyalty and his commitment is, is commendable. I don't know if, if he should be willing to put himself through another rebuild. I think the best option is to end this era as amicably as possible and let Matt know, hey, listen, you gave us a decade of loyalty, commitment, hard work, and dedication, and the fans will always appreciate you for that. But for the benefit of your career, since we've wasted it far enough, we owe it to you to make sure that you at least spend the last few years on a real contending team. Yes, definitely. And the Lions and Stafford need to stop sucking up to one another. Matthew Stafford can't last forever. The rebuild should start next year, period. And in their 47-7 loss to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they started Stafford again. He only had one drive where he injured his ankle. That's in addition to his torn rib cartilage. And he, of course, did not return. Now, Stafford reports say his status is indefinite for Week 17 at home against the Minnesota Vikings. But uh, I don't think Stafford should start. But uh, if they're going to start Stafford anyway, uh, then there's a problem. So, yeah. Frank, what's your analogy on that? Follow up as best you can. My analysis on this is pretty much spot on with what Ed said. The Lions have quit on themselves. And, you know, as for Matt Stafford, look... Matt, I can respect the fact that you want to go out there and play if you're able to physically. But at what point are you going to realize, hey, you're getting beat up all the time with all the injuries that you've had in your career, and you're doing it on a losing team? I'll admit, Matt Stafford is someone who I have liked since he was in college. And I think it's criminal that he's not on a contending team, and I think he needs to go there. So... How that happens this offseason, another topic for another time. I just hope it does, and that way he can at least hopefully go out a winner in his career because I don't want him to be looked at as the guy who couldn't win anything despite the fact that he went and gave it his all every time he took that field. So that's my thoughts on Stafford. And, of course, getting bludgeoned by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, again, not a huge surprise. Defensively, this team is just awful even though i know a lot of the defensive coaches were missing due to contact tracing to covid at least show some pride and show up and say hey we want to be here we want to at least finish our season out strong even though we may not win just show that you will want to be there don't make it look like that you're defeated before you even take the field and quit that's all i got to say yep well technically it's the same topic except uh, it's going to be developing later on. So, um, yeah, the rebuild, 
for example, here are a couple notes. They released defensive back Javon Kirst for violating team rules. He left his hotel without permission before he got released. He was scheduled to be a UFA, an unrestricted free agent, and he didn't even factor in much at all. And then wide receiver Marvin Jones Jr. was very excited, quote-unquote, to enter free agency. In other words, he's unsure about his future with the Lions. So we're going to go to Ed first and then Frank again. So, uh, Ed, uh, like I said in my opening statement, we are seeing the first stages of the Lions roster decimating. Well, it, it reminds me a lot of what the Tigers had to go through when eventually they had their fire cell. It was either 2015 or 16. Eventually started and siphoned into different years before culminating in 2017 with the trade of Justin Verlander. So we could see a similar approach here with what the Lions are doing, or at least uh, or understanding that, hey, we're going to give all these guys, but there's certain untouchables we're not giving up. I could see, you know, with the loss of Marvin Jones, that could open up uh, potentially more salary to what you want to pay Kenny Galladay. So that's always a, a silver lining in that regard. But yeah, in terms of what I've talked about earlier, uh, what I think this could build to and eventually should culminate with would be uh, the parting of ways with Matthew Stafford. Um, I've been feeling this for a while. I think now is the time to pull the trigger. The only question is what value do you get in return for him? That is really the main question here. And what team is willing to give that up for him in order to get Stafford in return, who quite be honest, he's a decade in, you know, he's obviously the talent is there. Uh, the commitment is there. The toughness is there. Uh, but you have to wonder with this, you know, consistent now back to back string seasons of injuries after injury after injuries derailing your season, you know, does that make teams wary of, of, of getting the quarterback at this stage of his career? That's yet to be seen. But still, but what the team itself is doing, it doesn't surprise me at all. Where they got rid of their team, uh, their coach and GM midseason, it, it it, and the fact that the Ford family, for now at least, is finally taking on uh, wanting to list, be more listenatory to an advisory group. Hey, maybe this could be a sign of, of, of changes actually coming, but uh, I'll be, you know, color me impressed when that actually happens. Yeah, definitely. Frank, it's your turn now. Follow up best you can. Yeah, the rebuild does have to start, and of course, it should have started a long time ago. But, of course, with both Bob Quinn and Matt Patricia out of the picture, you just have to wonder, who's it going to be that gets this thing going in the right direction? And, of course, I mean, as Ed mentioned, obviously he got him part ways from Matt Stafford. I know he's been a good soldier, but it's time to move on. And as for other guys, Marvin Jones, who I don't think is going to be brought back at all, yeah, that's going to... Clear up. That's gonna clear up money to possibly bring Kenny Galladay back as well, and maybe at least make some other improvements in free agency. So it's just the it's barely even the tip of the iceberg yet with the rebuild. So there's a lot more steps that have to be taken. But right now we've just set sail into these waters. Yep, definitely. And then the Lions general manager search. They interviewed Los Angeles Rams director of college scouting Brad Holmes for their general manager position. According to ESPN's Lindsay Theory, he will also interview with the Atlanta Falcons. That's the last I've heard, of course, probably last week. Holmes has had eight seasons of college scouting in the NFL. He helped construct a roster that won consecutive division titles in 2017 and 2018. He made an appearance in Super Bowl 53 and is on the brink of clinching a third playoff berth in four seasons in 2020. He helped oversee players like Aaron Donald, Todd Gurley, and Jared Goff and helped identify mid to late round selections that had played prominent roles, including safety John Johnson III, tight end Tyler Higby, and safety Jordan Fuller. We're going to go to Ed and then Frank again. Ed, Brad Holmes is another nominee. He could, uh, one of our five questions, uh, either Brad Holmes or Rick Smith, but uh, let's focus on Brad Holmes for a minute. What do you see in him? I see in Brad Holmes the capability of knowing how he could put together Core solid offense uh, filled with needed position players in, in, in specific spots, similar to what we had now with Stafford and, and the uh, tools that he was possessed with, but also the ability to recognize that, hey, at some point you got to get a true playmaker on defense. You saw how he did that by, by grabbing Aaron Donald when the Lions foolishly passed on him um, for Eric Ebron, and they ran with it ever since. He's one big reason why they got to that Super Bowl uh, a couple of years ago against, against New England. What else there is needs to be said about his capabilities there. Um, I'll get more on Rick Smith in a minute, but uh, I do like what I see out, out of Brad Holmes. I know Lewis Riddick was another name that's been brought up as attention. 
Um, I was quite interesting to, to hear that he, from what I could tell, he was seem to be leaning more towards on keeping Matthew Stafford. Now, I'm going to be honest as much as I would like to see, you know, pardon me, would like to see that happen. I also recognize maybe it's it's better for Stafford to be on a, better, a more contending team ready to win right now. So that would be my, you know, chief intrigue as in terms of whoever gets the job is, that should probably be the big elephant in the room. What are you going to do with Stafford? Right. Frank, follow up. What are you seeing Brad Holmes? Brad Holmes is somewhat of an interesting choice for GM. I mean, I don't think he was on many teams' radars at the beginning of when uh, Bob Quinn got fired. But again, he's shown that he can put together a roster with scouting guys and drafting them like Aaron Donald, as I mentioned. Even Jared Goff, who's been a decent quarterback, guys like, and bringing other guys in like Josh Reynolds, uh, Tyler Higby, a few, a few others as well. And plus, he's helped construct a roster that's been to a Super Bowl and is going to probably make the playoffs in, out of a tough NFC West again. So I'd say that he's interesting, but I'm going to be cautiously optimistic on this one because I that's not always going to translate to immediate successes in NFL GM. But, you know, the I think the interest is there. And, I mean, as for Lewis Riddick, I'm really not sure what to make of him saying that, oh, he built around Matt Stafford. I'm not sure if he's really considering that if he does get the job or if this is just kind of more that, oh, smoke screen that we're not trading him. And then as soon as he comes in, bang, we're moving him out. Who knows? There's a... There's a lot that remains to be seen, but I'm sure we'll get a lot clearer picture when more candidates interview. Yep, true. So, also, not uh, to mention, also not to mention, you would have to expect that whoever they do decide to pick as GM, they would have to have some type of insight on what coach they're bringing in. You have to assume that that, that has to play a factor as well. Good point. Good and point. You're absolutely seems, right, Ed. And seeing as that we're going to be moving on from Patricia and his culture, you have to wonder whoever this next GMB, whether it be Smith or it be Holmes or it be Riddick or someone else, whoever they bring in as a head coach is going to be real key indicator on how they want to build their around core culture, everything to, for this team and this franchise to emulate. Well, technically, from Bob Quinn, he's the he was the general manager and Matt Patricia was the head coach. Yeah, so, but they were trying to make themselves a Patriots clone. I don't want to see that with this one. So I want to see what you right. know, what this tenure, what this new venture would, would bring. Right. Both Patricia and Quinn were from the New England Patriots heading to the Detroit Lions, as we all recall. So that's all for Lions for this episode. Now we transition to the Pistons. They start 0-4. What else is new? They lost to the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves 111-101. to We uh, covered this live we covered portions of this live frank roy kessel and myself pistons uh, had the lead for most of the game but uh the timberwolves finally got their first lead of the game and then in the end they pulled away pistons uh had two leads at home against the cleveland cavaliers in their home opener in little caesars arena against the cavaliers but they blew both of them in the fourth quarter and in the overtime period and then they just fell flat in double overtime losing 128 to 119 it's not what you want to do. You got to seal it defensively. In the overtime period, they led by as many as nine, and they blew that, allowing the Cavaliers to force the second overtime period. And then the Pistons uh, lost again to the Atlanta Hawks at State Farm Arena, one twenty-eight to one twenty. Jeremy Grant, twenty-seven and six boards, but um, their defense uh, was nowhere. And then they lost to the Golden State Warriors, one sixteen to one hundred six. Jeremy Grant had another 27-point game, this time with seven rebounds. But considering the Pistons are 0-4 on paper, Ed, as we go over to you and then Frank, I don't think they stand a chance against the Boston Celtics or the Milwaukee Bucks in either of their doubleheaders. Ed, go ahead. Oh, no, no. Four games in, this looks like a team that uh, is going to be, once again, playing for the lottery. And again, this was expected, okay? This is why I'm not freaking out or being emotional about this right now, because this was expected. If you want to call the process clone, go ahead. It is what it is. We saw what Stefanski did, bring in his group. Now he's brought in Troy Weaver. We saw Troy Weaver blow up the roster the way he did. It's all part of his plan and motion of what he wants to do for the long-term goal, long-term vision. What it may lead to, uh, one of the young, talented prospects, many talented prospects I've brought up before, uh, I won't bear to mention repeating because it's been repeated ad nauseum, but that should be one of your specific goals of what to grab on 
uh, for the next three or five, three to five years. I will say at least it, it is some gleam spot, gleaming bright spots in between. Uh, takes, for example, Blake Griffin, the development of his of his three point shooting. I mean, for goodness sake, he had eight threes uh, in the double OT game against Cleveland, six in the first half. I think it came down to more of him uh, fixing up his form, his shooting motion, and not having such ridiculous, uh, acrobatic, crazy shots. Just simple form instead of with your jump shot and picking and choosing at the right moments. Eight of 16, eight of 19, whatever it was, uh, it's quite impressive considering a guy that, remember, started out in his career known primarily as an inside guy at the paint. Now has developed his game to now where he's considered a stretch big um, or a stretch four, however you want to describe him, or what position he plays. Now, the drawback, of course, is his that is the fact that he's injury prone, um, as evident by the fact that he apparently suffered a concussion um, in last night's loss to Golden State. Now, as regards to how his eventual recovery time, I hope he gets well enough. But again, that's the trade off if you want to use that as as a punning term. Uh, in terms of describing what it's like to try to negotiate moving his contract down the road, that yes, you get a talented, terrific player that can still contribute on any given point in time, especially to a contending team. But the question is, can you have him on the floor long enough? That still yet remains to be seen. I appreciate the fact this team is competitive and looks tough, but they still lack the ability to close games. You should not have blown an eight-point lead within two minutes, two minutes left to go in over, of an OT game. I understand that Drummond was getting his offensive rebound. I understand that Kevin Love is going to be, do Kevin Love things to shoot the lights out. But you've got to find a way to play better containment on that and, frankly, get some stops and shut this game down. And Because when you got the double overtime, you were just gas and exhausted. And that's when Cleveland found their second gear and took over. So there's still things yet to work on. But, again, there's still things I like. I really like the addition of Jeremy Grant so far. I think he's a much-needed uh, pickup. You can provide uh, scoring when you need it. There's that to look forward to. But other than that, then, yeah, this is all what I expected. The team was going to do poorly. It was going to look really bad and hurt at the beginning. But if things follow through and we see it out, it may be worth it in the end. Oh, yeah, definitely. And you touched on Blake Griffin's three-point shooting against Cleveland. They might uh, use that continuously, even if they're trying to tank. Frank, follow up. Well, let me preface this by saying... The Pistons are pretty much doing what they're doing as part of trusting their version of the process. This isn't like the Philadelphia 76ers or Sacramento Kings who are just being perpetually bad and getting blown out. This team is at least showing some drive and motivation to say, hey, we're going to compete. We may not win, but we're going to fight till the end. Granted, they do have to get better at closing out games, as that alluded to, especially that loss to the Cavaliers. But, you know, there's some positives with this team that you have to take. I mean, Jeremy Grant's been a very nice addition. Blake Griffin's three-point shooting has gotten a lot better than in years past. I still think that could possibly make him a trade piece at the deadline. But one trade piece that I would definitely keep my eye on is Derrick Rose. Because he's in the final year of his deal. And I'd say if he can at least uh, play at three-quarters of what he was last year, then I think he'd be able to get some nice assets in return. Or say from the Lakers, if they wanted to, if they were looking for some point guard help, or another team that's looking for point guard help. So hey, how about one of those billion? How about one of those billions of picks that Oklahoma City has? (laughs) Yeah, I'm pretty pretty sure Troy Weaver is going to be on the phone Mm. with his old boss Sam Presti in Oklahoma City to get picks from them as well. I doubt we'll get Shade Gilgis Alexander, but think of it this way: you could get a good mentor in Rose. Oh yeah, hey, yeah, I could go with that. But again, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, this team's not going to win anything of value, but you know what? At least they're competitive, and they're not going to get blown out consistently. So right. you pretty much got to take the good with the bad. Yes, you do exactly. Yep, because the objective is to win, not to purposely tank. So yeah, normally you play to win the game. As for minute, it was to say. So uh, we're not done with Pistons yet. We got a big follow-up story here. From Eric Woodyard of ESPN now, uh, Frank, Roy, and I went over an article regarding Pistons owner Tom Gores' prison telecom facility and Bianca Tylek being involved. She was an activist that was uh, calling for the NBA to force Tom Gores to sell the Pistons. Now, this headline reads, as nonprofit group pushes for him to sell the team, 
Detroit Pistons owner Tom Gore says he's committed to changing system but needs time, unquote. So uh, here we go. Detroit Pistons owner Tom Gore said Saturday that a recent advertisement calling on the league and its owners to force him to sell his club because of his ownership of a prison telecom company hurts and that he is committed to changing the system. Gore said during media availability ahead of Detroit's home opener, quote, it hurts. I'm not going to tell you that it doesn't. I have a family, but then I always kind of look at things and say life's happening for a reason and you're put in that place to make a difference. So maybe that's a blessing. Then I also think about people, especially in the African-American community, who have gone through a lot more judgment and pain than I have. They might judge me a certain way, then I say, get your crap together, Tom. Let's go fight this fight, unquote. Maybe that's a blessing. Guys, that's not a blessing at all. Oh, my God. But continuing on, the full-page advertisement in the December 20th edition of the New York Times read, quote, if Black Lives Matter... What are you doing about Detroit Pistons owner Tom Gorse, unquote? Bianca Tylek is the founder and executive director of Worth Rises, the New York-based nonprofit that paid for the advertisement. Tylek told ESPN, don't expect somebody who's exploiting struggling families to tell you that they're going to keep exploiting struggling families. The bottom line is Tom is in a tough position at this point because he's getting a lot of bad public press. The most important point is that we are three years into his ownership of the company and he's talking about changes now unquote she added quote if that was really sincere and he had plans to do all those things what has he been doing for three years and the little that has happened all happened in the last few months all happened while the business was in a huge boom because of covid unfortunately right now prison visits are shut down unquote platinum equity gore's private equity firm based in beverly hills california acquired Securus in 2017 for $1.6 billion, but activists argue that this ownership doesn't align with the NBA's support of social justice and the Black Lives Matter movement. Gore said he's committed to changing the system, but that it will take time and patience. He said, quote, we've been doing, it's just that not everybody knows, and maybe we've even undercommunicated on it, but we have been really doing a lot of work to reform the industry and even forgetting the company. And it's crazy. It's not that I'm excited about it. I just think this is a unique opportunity for me and for us to impact our country and the world in a bit, because it's not really about this one company. It's about an industry that really does need to be changed. We've recognized it, but we've been doing it also. And we can communicate with you guys more and more on this topic. We've been doing it. We're aligning ourselves with really important people, influential people. The one thing about the space in that industry is that we really have to keep partnering with people. We have a very, very productive activist that we're speaking to, which is Bianca Tylek. We're drawing on people from the league. We're discussing things with the Players Association. So I think we're doing it, and this is even beyond basketball. Basketball is basketball, unquote. Gores resigned from his role as a trustee at the L.A. County Museum of Art in October amid the controversy surrounding the way he manages the phone services Securus provides to prisons. Gores had been a trustee of the museum since 2006. Gores claims that he and his team are pushing to stop the exploitation of prisoners and their families, notably through prison phone firms. Dr. Benjamin F. Chavis, Jr., President and CEO of the National Newspaper Publishers Association endorsed Gores' effort at Securus in an op-ed piece published by the Michigan Chronicle on December 8th. Chavis, once an assistant to Martin Luther King Jr., noted major change still needs to happen, but that the efforts were an important start. Platinum Equity has vowed to support efforts to reform business practices in the corrections services industry, such as reducing the average cost of calls by 30% over the past three years, while promising to commit an additional 15% reduction over the next three years, according to company updates. Gores has also agreed to give all of his personal profits from Securus to reform efforts, according to Mark Barnhill, whom I mentioned by last name by mistake, partner at Platinum Equity and alternate governor for the Pistons. Barnhill also said Worth Rises had been invited to join in that collaboration, but that the group declined in favor of shouting from an isolated fringe. Tylek vehemently denies that was ever the case. She said, quote, this idea that he's a change agent, it's honestly so remarkably paternalistic. Like, it's so patronizing to people. It's like, I have $6 billion, but I see this as a remarkable opportunity for me to do something good for society. We're not asking you to come save people. We're asking you to stop taking from them. 
to stop something good and all those things, you have to stop doing the harm that you're trying to unwind. Those two things can't operate in the same space, unquote. The NBA acknowledged Worth Rise's passion for prison reform and told ESPN in a statement that has been, quote, in regular communication with Tom Gores regarding their concerns, unquote. The league said Gores and his colleagues have had ongoing discussions with a number of nonprofit organizations focused on similar reform and, quote, we support their efforts to address these important issues, unquote. That's the end of this article. Now we're going to go to Ed and Frank on this one. As always, Ed, we've learned even on Twitter that prison phone costs are a scam. I did a little research. Tom Gores is charging $25 instead of $15 when he, was, when he said $15. And that's a total disgrace. Even some of Pistons' Twitter is getting into it, and they're pretty pissed off, Ed. Go ahead. Yeah, they have every right to be. Gorris, as much as I like the fact that he was contributive enough to certain, we know for a fact he was a contributor to the Democratic Party. I think we have seen him be very supportive of what the team, what the NBA has done in terms of wanting to bring awareness more to social justice issues. I think he was even in solidarity with the governor at one point, excuse me, in regards to some of these civil, or, or either that or the mayor, Mayor Duggan, in regards to civil protest and, and what we saw in events in uh, yeah happening and transpiring in the country throughout the summer. I get all that, but still, like I mentioned earlier, or I might, might, might not mention now, but I will mention more than once here, actions matter than your words and what you say or put the paper. It's the actions. And this action was, not, frankly, not noble at all, downright disappointing, and down, if not outright disgusting. These prisoners are already going through a lot. Why seek the need to take advantage of them even more? I get it. You're, in a, you're a capitalist in a capitalistic country. The, the end-all, be-all is to make a profit no matter what. But at some point, you got to draw a line. You, you, you just have to. you got to find a boundary there. He did not find it there, and he should be reprimanded. He, should, he has every right to be called out on it because this is flat-out should not be happening at all. Now, do I think he's going to lose the team because of it? No. This isn't something like we saw with Donald Sterling where even before uh, the TMZ tape blew up, uh, people were discussing out in public and on television the chance that he very well was and it turned out to be, in fact, was a racist. Now, I don't think we're going to see that type of evidence or smoking gun hit Tom Gorris uh, like we saw it hit Donald Sterling. But uh, I still I still believe that no matter what, uh, Tom Gorris needs to put figuratively where his money where his mouth is and show the proper contributions needed to show that, hey, He's part of the, he really does mean it when he says Black Lives Matter or he's with the NBA or he's with the players and the teams. If you really want to be about it or show about it, talk about it, then be about it. And this is not the way to do it. So he's got to do better. Right. Either end this prison telecom stuff or sell the Pistons, one of the two. And Tom Gore still has time to make up his mind. Frank, I would assume you'd have to agree with us, but uh, just follow up as best as you can. I do agree with both of you gentlemen. And look... While I will acknowledge that Gorse is trying to say the right things by saying, hey, we need to bring attention to this matter that not everyone knows about, the cost of prison phone calls, the fact that he's trying to shake both hands is disgusting in itself, especially in today's climate. We know how much the NBA is behind the Black Lives Matter movement and how much the owners are trying to get behind that. Well, Tom, it's time that you do... Less talk and more action, whether that means you get rid of your company or completely slice the rates of prison phone calls. Just do something that at least to show that you actually care. The talk is sweet and all, but until you actually do something, everyone's going to look at you as the guy who's just trying to have his cake and eat it too. And that's not a place you want to be in this day and age. Nope, not at all. And one of the Pistons Twitter members on Twitter that chirped about it, they labeled it as a scam because of what I mentioned, the $25 legitimate when it was 15 I mean, of course, it tells you the story right there. And Tom Gores must face at least some kind of consequence, if at least one, if not more than one. Well, ta- but- well Taylor, real quick, uh, was that $25 for just a 15-minute phone call or was that for a 25-minute phone call? Because I believe we said it was $15 for a 15-minute call last week. So just, well, I just wanted to be the, clear here's on the that. Pro- here's the problem that makes this one guy label this as a scam. It's supposed to be $15 for a 15-minute call, but that 15-minute call costs $25 when there's actually no fee. 
twenty five dollars for fifteen so the, oh, minutes. Oh, okay. I just want, I just okay. I just wanted to make sure that uh, where that extra ten dollar fee was coming from, and I find out, yeah, we've definitely got a scam on our hands, and that just makes it even more disgusting. Yeah, that's not a fee at all. Ugh. So, yeah, Ed, I'll bet that disgusts you too, right? Yep. So, what do you think? Um, the silence said it all. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you set yourself up on that one. Yeah. Yep. True. So that's Pistons, and now we transition to college basketball before our five question segment. Michigan State Spartans men's basketball now ranked 17th, as far as I'm concerned. They lost to ninth ranked Wisconsin, the Badgers, 85 to 76 on Christmas Day. Joey Hauser. 27 and 6. He continues to be a heck of a center, scoring a lot of points in the uh, lane. But like we pointed out earlier, Michigan State's uh, lack of defense continues to be their undoing for now. But one of the five questions is will it be their undoing for the rest of the season? We'll answer that a bit later on. Ed, we'll start with you and then we'll go over to Frank. Ed, go ahead. Yeah, I got to say, um, even though they had a great start to this month by beating Duke and had going on the stretch they were on, there were some telltale signs that this team may not be as good as advertised when they had their struggles with Oakland a few weeks back. I think that was just a red flag that everyone just wanted to ignore, but now it's apparently obvious that, hey, even though they got the win, they still gave up 91 points. Like, really, you need a, over 100 points to beat Oakland? I know they're not that bad and not bottom-level trash, but still, come on. And now, and that was in regulation, the, too. Right, regulation, not even an overtime game. So the fact right. that they've gone out on this bad stretch of where, you know, we know that they're not primarily known to be an offensive team from the get-go, that's in their blueprint and that's in their DNA. So when you have stretches of the game where your offense is going to predictably go stagnant, that's where you need your defense to step up and help you keep, at least keep the game tight and close. That did not happen, for example, against Wisconsin, and that's why they lost that game in that last four minutes. They were down by four or so points about four minutes to go, and then they, ended, they just did nothing. Their offense did nothing. They couldn't generate anything. And the, and the defense didn't hold up their end of the bargain by keeping the game tight, allowing their dog a chance to get back into it. And it was just too late at that point. So what we're seeing here is a very troubling lack of defense. And that's, not, and that's something that should not be said or seen in regards to a Tom Izzo coach team. When you think of Tom Izzo and what his style and his philosophy is, defense immediately comes to forefront. There's a reason why that, that uh, group of recruits uh, that eventually helped to win the, two, the 2000 national title, there's a reason why they're called the Flint Stones, okay? And it wasn't just for a, a play on words, okay? Uh, they were rocky, rugged, and tough with their defense. When you think of Mateen in 2000, or think of Draymond Green or Adrian Payne, or uh, just for starters, many others as well. It goes to show that really defense is the name of the game, especially if you're playing a conference such as the Big Ten. Izzo knew that, but for some reason, he's not getting that type of defensive production out of his players this year. And I think that is troubling to see, knowing that you're still getting ready to head into the heart of a big schedule with January coming up. Uh, forget the fact that you won't face Michigan until until February. What you need to focus on is making sure that you don't get blown out out of the water lose your chance of playing for the conference title even before you get to play the, the face mission right frank follow up i know people are saying don't panic when it comes to michigan state basketball well news flash you do need to panic because this team has just gone flat offensively has no identity they can't defend at all and that comes from basic fundamentals from what i watched a little bit of the minnesota game where they weren't able to they didn't switch on a play where foster lawyer was matched up against one of minnesota's bigs and they had to have thomas kithier out on the perimeter that's a switch you should make every time and also this team doesn't have a true center i mean everyone raves about how thomas kithier is i mean look yeah he can hustle and yeah i hear he's a great practice player newsflash if you practice how you play, but you got to play how you practice. So, yep. just leave it at that. And also, when are we going to realize that Foster Lawyer cannot play in the Big Ten? And I know everyone was pointing to his 20-point performance against Eastern Michigan. Eastern Michigan is at the bottom of the barrel in the Mid-American Conference. So if he can have great games against bottom of the barrel, Mid-American Conference teams, then maybe the Mid-American Conference is where he belongs. That's just my thoughts. So hey, that's they why don't Ryan have... Lombardi's going to NYU. <laughs> yeah, and he's yep, probably going to end... that. And he's probably gonna end up terrorizing the Toledo Rockets 
but I'll leave it there. But staying on subject, the fact is that this team doesn't even have a true point guard. Rocket Watts is not a point guard. He's a two guard. And I know he's having to play point this year. He's out of position. I like and a also, switch hitter in baseball, but yeah, continue. Yeah. And I don't know what's up with Aaron Henry. Izzo benched him to start against Minnesota. I guess he wanted to send him a message, but then again, I guess he put up a deplorable effort against Wisconsin. So, again, I can't fault Izzo for that. But at what point is this team going to realize, hey, what do we need to do to get better? I think they probably got high off their own supply. People say, oh, this is going to be the best defensive team that Izzo has ever had. Yeah, that got shot down after the game against the University of Detroit that I watched, and I could see that there were problems. And now they've just reared their ugly head even more. And you know what? They've got a chance to fix it come this Saturday against Nebraska, who just lost by 36 to Ohio State. So we'll see if any improvements are made. And if not, then it's going to be a long time until the end of the season because we've seen that the Big Ten is clearly the best conference in college basketball this year. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be an absolute dogfight. Oh, yeah, definitely. We'll look forward it's to bad. that one. And it's bad enough that they started out 0-3 in the Big Ten for the first time since 2001. 2002, if I'm not mistaken, and I believe the point guard for that team was Marcus Taylor, who wasn't a true point guard, so I'm starting to see a lot of parallels here. We'll just hey, see where it goes. History. Don't learn from history, don't repeat it. Very right. true, Ed. Very true. <laughs> yep. For the Michigan Wolverines, now up to 19th, they beat the Nebraska Cornhuskers 80-69. to Franz Wagner, uh, double-double, 20 and 10 boards. Not bad. Ed? What are your thoughts on the Wolverines? Oh, man, what I, what I have to say. Um, I think this is a team showing that they mean business because, remember, I think they were uh, considered as a potential dark horse team to make a deep run in the tournament before things got shut down with, corona, with COVID-19. So this is a team knowing that uh, how things ended for them last season so abruptly, I think they want to make more of a statement uh, with this start. I think the credit obviously has to go up top with Juwan Howard, what he's doing. Yes, you can say this is all he's doing this with B-Line's players. But yes, that is true. That's going to happen when you have changeover from one coach to the next. You're always going to have someone else's players. But what you do with them is what matters. And we're seeing what he's doing with those players, plus his own kids that he's getting through these uh, recruitment as well. Now, it helps that you have a player like Isaiah Livers, um, instead of going to the, to the NBA, deciding to stay at least another year at school. It helps uh, when you have in a Franz Wagner, you know, Moe's little bro picking up a slack, but also not just only, if you can imagine Ignaz Brasdakis, but also in guard form, uh, you found the perfect replacement for Xavier Simpson in more ways than one. Um, only exception would be you, uh, you, you trade off some of the assistant playmaking more so for offensive production, uh, but it shows in, in leaps and bounds and, and can come crucial in, in whenever you need a bucket or if Livers isn't performing well. And same thing goes here with Hunter Dickinson, who, in my view, is a more than adequate replacement for John Teske and is showing that in a conference like the Big Ten, you need a big man at the paint. How many times for years do we see Michigan get just dominated and just bullied at the rim? And they didn't have adequate enough big men to do it. Now we see what they can do when they have one. We saw it with Teske. Now we're seeing with, with Hunter Dickinson this big seven foot one massive truck. Okay, you see he, he has the ability to deny you if you go, even you're going for a dunk at the rim. So between Dickinson, Franz, and Livers, that is the three headed monster that this Wolverines team need to heavily rely and depend on. That is Severus right there. And if all three heads are working together as one cohesive unit, that is, quite frankly, in my view, the most dangerous team to look out for in the Big Ten, bar none. Yes. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm not saying that be a slap. I'm saying that because I think I believe that to be absolute cold hard truth because they got the right coach that's getting them in the right gears and they have the right players cooking at the right time and things – now, again, I'm not predicting undefeated season, and no way in hell am I predicting that, especially with this schedule coming up. In fact, I'll be, fr frankly, by the time they get to MSU, if they're within striking distance or one or two games within that conference lead, I'll consider that impressive because, we get again, in this conference with these teams, it's going to be a bloodbath this year, and I can't wait to see it. Especially when they head into the rest of the Big Ten Conference. Frank, follow up. I mean, really, all I can say is, 
I just can't wait to see what this Michigan team can do when they get into the meat of the Big Ten schedule. I know they ended up getting a win over Nebraska, who isn't very good, but how can they do against a team like Wisconsin or a team like Maryland or even teams like Northwestern and Rutgers, who have actually been surprisingly good? So, I mean, the bit we've said it time and time again, the Big Ten's a meat grinder, but I want to see if this Michigan team is legitimate or if this is another one that a team that was like last year where they peaked really early and then you got into the january february portion of the big 10 slate and then they just kind of got ran over so we'll see what happens yep we'll keep an eye on the michigan wolverines now in college football uh, like ed mentioned michigan state spartans uh quarterback Rocky Lombardi has transferred to Northern Illinois and then Michigan Wolverines football defensive end Aiden Hutchinson is staying at the University of Michigan but redshirt sophomore Cam McGrone has entered the NFL draft so that leads us to five questions question number one have the Lions completely ruined Matthew Stafford's entire NFL career Ed we'll start with you go ahead I'm leaning towards no, but it's not a safe no. I understand what this team's track record, what they've done with Calvin Johnson, what they did with Barry Sanders, and to a certain extent, and Dominican Sue. But that's just the notable headliners. Think about the guys like the Herman Moores, the Johnny Mortons over the years, guys that they just absolutely wasted. Now, some of that was not on their own. I understand there's a Titus Young here or there who completely botched their own career. I can't explain to Eric Ebron's or the Brandon Pettigrews, but the guys like that, that I, the other guys before that I've mentioned, is a consistent, proven track record with this franchise. And you would think they'll expect me to say yes, but in terms of what I've seen also of how, let's say, well, what Peyton Manning did at the end of his run, at the end of his career, or to bring things more local, what Justin Verlander did when he got traded to the Houston, uh, to the Houston Astros, why not see this? Maybe this is the optimist in me, but I could see something like that where, hey, if a team like Denver or I wouldn't say, I don't know, maybe they still trust Phil Rivers, so I can't say Indy, but a team like the Denver Broncos, for example, or a team like the Dallas Cowboys, they may that that's going to need a quarterback since what their guys hurt. But what's going to happen? Like, do you want to pay Dak all that money and pay Stafford? Like, it's a it's a sticky situation there. So I don't know how they're going to do that. Or, hey, I understand, you know, we just got talking to, about them, and it may seem so tacky and a post-mortem type of thing to do, but what about New England? We saw New Eng- what, what New England has done this year, and it's not looked pretty. Unfortunately, as much as I love Cam Newton, he may not just frankly have it anymore. And the same may be said of Stafford, but for some reason, there is a more dependable reliability on what Stafford can do at this point compared to Cam Newton. So by the slimmest of margins, I'm going to say that, no, they have not completely stat- ruined Stafford's NFL career. There's still time to save it. Just get him the hell up out of here first and get him on to a better team. Yeah, give him more time to heal, too. Frank, what's your answer to question number one? Kind of like, I'm kind of with that. I'm leaning no, but I think it's really going to depend on if Stafford gets moved this offseason. I mean, I know we mentioned the Cowboys or the Broncos, but my dark horse has been the Pittsburgh Steelers from the move to because Ben Roethlisberger doesn't look like he's going to last much longer. He's got a lot of miles on his tires, and he's taken about as much of a beating, if not more, than Stafford has. So I would look to see if team moves him in the offseason if they move him then we'll see him and if he ends up excelling then i'll say that he hasn't been ruined but if they don't move him at all then you can say yeah he's been ruined yep good deal question number two which would you rather have as the lions next general manager rick smith or brad holmes ed we'll start with you I got to be honest, I understand that um, things eventually did not work out the way they were supposed to in Houston, but you can blame that more on Bill O'Brien than anything. But look at what the roster that Rick Smith built. Sean Watson, J.J. Watt, DeAndre Hopkins, that alone. Okay, let's not mention you know the work that he did with Andre Johnson and, and, and whatnot as well, other guys over the years. Arian Foster is another guy, okay? So Rick Smith was a guy that knew how to pick and choose talent where it was needed and necessary. So that could be a similar situation to where if, you, if you're going to put a gun to my head and tell me, hey, which guy are you picking? I would actually have to take Rick Smith over Brad Holmes because knowing the type of caliber of player that he can see and pick out and choose, like, come on. Groups like J.J. Watt do not grow on trees. And the fact that you snatched a guy like Deshaun Watson and you got a DeAndre Hopkins before Bill O'Brien gave him away foolishly, to me that speaks of what you can do in terms of um, – making picks as a general manager and already shows you're a massive improvement over the last guy we had. So I would say by that measure, 
I would have to go with Rick Smith. Frank, what's your choice? After hearing what Ed said, I was probably leaning a little bit more towards Holmes when we were talking earlier, but, you know, I can't really ignore what Rick Smith has done with drafting of J.J. Watt, Deshaun Watson, and getting DeAndre Hopkins before Bill O'Brien gave him away to the Arizona Cardinals for a ham sandwich. So I think Smith would be more ideal, but, you know, I will say I don't think Holmes would be a bad idea either. So I think if you got two solid candidates hits to consider, at least you got, at least you have some options out there. And both would definitely be better than the previous regime. Oh, yeah, definitely. Question number three. Oh. Go ahead. I said you would hope, but who knows with this franchise's history. Oh, yeah, definitely. Question number three, how low can the Pistons go in the Eastern Conference standing? Ed, we'll start with you. I would say 13th to 15th, since we're expecting. Yeah, since we're expecting expecting tank job, then that would be the expectation. Now, they may show a little bit more effort, show a little more pride, win a couple games, say finish at 11th, 12th, that type of thing. But but the thing is, when you inch up higher and higher and higher, up that to 10th, to 9th, and dangerously close to the 8th spot, you know, I understand that teams have not been quite rewarded as often for tanking in in, in recent years. But uh, frankly, if you're the Golden State Warriors, you may have gotten a gift in disguise with Andre, uh, uh, excuse me, with uh, with James Wiseman, and now with Clay Thompson out, assuming that Steph Curry at least does some his usual Steph Curry things, we could see a potential situation where the Warriors are in the, are in the lottery again. And who would have thought? You know, especially with more up and coming talent that's that's on the horizon here, uh, that's a strict possibility. So, with, seeing what the Pistons are doing right now. I'm completely fine with as long as we get one of these key guys in these few up in these next upcoming drafts. Yep, Frank, what's your answer to question number three? Definitely, kind of expecting the Pistons to be more in that 11 to 13 range because again, they're going to compete and they're going to try and win. You know, they'll win a couple of games, but I just don't think they're good enough to be a playoff team this year. And hopefully, they do end up winning the lottery and. Maybe you get somebody like a Cade Cunningham in this upcoming draft, but we'll, we'll see what happens with it. I just think that anywhere from 11 to 13 just seems fair. I don't think they're going to be 14 or 15 unless some unless they get hit with unless they get hit with catastrophic injuries and yeah, I was going to say they'll probably yeah, a, drop. Com- a combination combination of injuries to Rose, Blake, and say for instance, for example, Seku, you know. That that would that pretty much be the reason. Yeah, Blake Griffin uh, is in concussion protocol, for example. Not good. Mm-hmm. Right, and we know how D. Rose usually has his, 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 has his yearly breakdown as well. So, again, that's another thing that could derail some teams in terms of looking for a trade partner. Yeah. Now, question number four. How much longer will it take for Pistons owner Tom Gores to either change the whole prison telecom system or sell the Pistons. Ed, we'll start with you again. The NBA is going to give him as much time as he needs and or slash wants uh, because this isn't quite a situation where, yes, it's bad PR, but it's nowhere near as bad as to what could have been if he was on caught on visual or audio recording denigrating an entire race of people or making remarks or if there was a, a, a shown uh, paper trail of him doing nefarious actions. Like, say, for example... Robert, you know, the Robert Kraft massage parlor thing, but with more and way worse evidence, that type of thing. Or the Donald Sterling uh, scandal that I brought up earlier. The NBA would need to that, have that type of blowback on them to really force Gores' hands. And unless he, a guy like I mentioned before, who has shown, who has given money to the Democratic Party before, has shown his, his affiliations and has voiced his stances before on social issues, while this makes him look like a hypocrite, massive hypocrite in that regard, I agree, it's nowhere near as bad as it could be if he was caught on tape saying or doing horrible, awful, atrocious actions. So unless that type of evidence suddenly drops itself out of nowhere like mana from heaven, I doubt Tom Gores is going to be forced to sell anything. Right. Frank? What's your answer to question number four? I'm in the same boat as Ed. Unless there's that smoking gun that labels Tom Gores as an ardent racist, much like Donald Sterling, Adam Silver's not going to step in and force his hand. So, I mean, do I wish that he does end up making a change and his actions do, will end up speaking louder than words and that he doesn't end up looking like a hypocrite? Yes. I do, but again, that's going to take time. So, to sum it all up, unless some bombshell drops... I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Right. Question number five. Actually, I'm going to change it up. Question number five. Will the Michigan State Spartans men's basketball team be out of the top 25 if they keep up their lackluster performance, especially on their defensive end of the court? Ed. 
We'll start with you. Abs- absolutely, because the name of the game is if you keep losing games, you're going to fall out further with the people that complete these rankings, and you're going to fall out. It's just simple fundamentals here. Now, MSU, as long as they stretch, to get, stretch together a, a string of wins where, hey, they win two or three in a row, lose one, come back again, and then don't basically don't go on any more major losing streaks like the one like the skid that they're currently on right now. They'll be fine. But in terms of what you want to see out of the your usual Izzo team, I don't think the phrase "just wait till March" is going to apply here. Absolutely not. So if anything, I'll be more concerned about what is this team going to do to help uh, defensively that make it should contribute to whether or not this scene this season ends either in the first weekend of, of, of March, or even, dare I say it, even before that. Right. Frank, question number five, what's your answer? There is no waiting until March. It's got to be fixed right now, and it's got to start this Saturday against Nebraska. You can't keep going on these losing streaks, otherwise the tournament streak is going to come to an end. So fix it now, or you're going to have a really long off season to think about why you didn't fix it. Yep. Yeah. So you're this, you're saying yes, like Ed did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and this, so basically, this is my challenge essentially to, to Izzo and Michigan State. I can't really say two months because we're essentially at the end of December, January is here. You got a month. You got a month between now and Michigan. Be ready for that one. Otherwise, you're going to get ran over. Right. And that is five questions. So uh, that concludes another episode of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Stables Media. And it's the last episode for uh, the year 2020. Bring on 2021. We're just near that mark. So... Before we go, we want to remind everyone to download the all-new social sports app called Big It, which influences more and more people to love sports. Enter the referral code STABLES with a capital S and the letter B in the middle when you sign up. Available on the Apple App Store and Google Play, download the Big It app and sign up with the referral code STABLES with a capital S and the letter B in the middle, lowercase. Gentlemen, excellent job as always. That concludes another fine episode of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Stables Media. Like I mentioned before, we'll be back next week to kick off the year 2021. For Ed Smith and Frank Badger, and on behalf of Darren Weiss, this is Taylor Phillips signing off. Thanks very much for listening, downloading, and sharing. And remember, the truth is out there. TTFN, toss off for now. Power to the people. Hit them with the hind. We rest our case. Stay safe and happy new year. The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers, nor does it represent or compete against any mainstream media in the state of Michigan. It is also not for entertainment or debating purposes. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. And it is for every sports fan's own good because the truth is out there. (laughs) 